All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the downside of doing all this traveling is I'm constantly sick. Um, so I'm a bit sick. So if you're in the first two rows, I apologize. Uh, you'll probably be sick by the end of this talk. Um, <clears throat> but yes, I'm going to talk about um, pyramids are ancient. So that is a fact. Pyramids are ancient. Uh, they were built about 4,000 years ago um, by the Egyptians. And there's been lots of other pyramids as well. Um, but yeah, I'm very sorry. It's probably not the type of pyramid you were expecting me to talk about. That is the length of my knowledge of pyramids, by the way, um, exactly when they were founded. But you're probably more interested in me talking about triangles, because this isn't a pyramid. This is a triangle. Um, yes, as an industry, we love to draw triangles. Uh, we have the test automation triangles. We have automation triangles. We have testing triangles. Uh, and the thing about these is they aren't ancient. There is a pretty much a new one every week. I tweeted one two days ago, so I'm not helping this uh, thing either. Um, but there is a new one every week. And I don't know why, and I don't know officially when it started, but the person who wrote about uh, Mike Cohen, the first person who wrote about these, he wasn't really trying to define it as a strategy. He was more trying to help people you know, see how they're doing and how their automation efforts are. However, we decided that wasn't good enough, so we drew as many pyramids as we could think of. And then uh, Alistair Scott went, we're not doing the pyramid. We're upside down and doing lots of exploratory testing. So he made the ice cream cone, if any of you have seen the ice cream cone. Um, <clears throat> and then someone went, the weather's a bit bad near our pyramid, so we're going to put a cloud on top of it uh, to make it rain uh, and see how that works with our automation pyramid. And basically, there's lots of versions of it. However. It is everywhere. I don't know how many times I hear the word pyramid, but what I've started to see, and maybe it might be just a UK thing, but um, companies asking me, our automation isn't going very well. We're, for, we're following the pyramid, but we're still having lots of issues. So people are now using it as a strategy. And I think there's a bit of a flaw there. But don't worry, there's more pyramids, triangles. Um, and people have started labeling them because that's going to make it easier, right? And obviously, if we put labels on things, it means we can explain more. So if you look at the very one on the left, some person decided that it was um, more expensive to automate at the top of the pyramid uh, than it was at the bottom. Now, if you think about building a pyramid, it probably takes a lot longer to get stones to the top. So it probably is more expensive than building it at the bottom. Uh, but in the testing world, it's kind of a misconception. Uh, and then we also have time. Apparently, it takes uh, a lot longer to run at the top than it does at the bottom. And maybe that's true. Maybe it isn't. Um, but as soon as we add labels to it, and then we give it a name, we call it the ideal test pyramid. So now it's even better, right? This is what we're all trying to work towards and achieve. Um, but yeah, we've started adding percentages to these things, like we're all meant to be doing certain mounts in certain levels. And this is it. This is how you do automation. So this is me. This is what I've done in every job I have. I literally find a big open space in the company, and I sit there doing this. And then people look at me going, what are you doing, Richard? I'm going, I'm designing a pyramid. Uh, what's it for? I don't know yet. I will get to that bit. Um, but I do. I sit there trying to calculate how's our pyramid going to look, uh, or how are we going to approach this problem. Uh, and here's how we do it. So I want to talk about automation strategy. I'm having a bit of fun at the pyramid. If you like the pyramid, that's fine. You're free to like whatever you like. Um, but I found the pyramid useful in certain situations. But I want to talk about automation strategy, because the pyramid isn't a strategy. The pyramid has its usage, and we'll get to that. But on its own, it's not really a strategy. So let's have a look at automation strategy. I can't see you, so normally I would ask people how many of you know the word testability, but I can literally see eight people. <laughs> After that, it's just darkness. Um, but the word testability is really important in the world of testing. Now, if you ever come across a word that has ability at the end of it, stick it in brackets, move it to the left, and put the word to in front of it. Testability is our ability to test. Automatability, our ability to automate, controllability, and so forth. There's a billion illities out there. Uh, it's a very cool thing to blog about if you're into the world of blogging. Blog about illities, you'll get lots of views and lots of reads. Um, but testability is at the foundation of all our testing efforts. Your ability to test will in turn determine your ability to automate. Um, so if you can have a view on testability, then you can maximize it to your advantage. However, very few people um, talk about this. We talk about lots of things, but we very rarely talk about testability. However, a lot of you will do it, and it might be intrinsic. Um, now it might be probably quite tacit as well, um, but it does exist, and we talk about it a lot. So we're going to talk about testability. 
So I tweeted this the other day, <clears throat> just for fun. I like tweeting stuff for fun. And it got 11,000 views on LinkedIn uh, and like, I don't know, like 150 likes on Twitter. And I don't know why. <laughs> I drew this and thought, you know what? I've, I've had a revelation. Testability should be at the base of my pyramid. But what I was doing, this is how I got to this, I was Googling pyramids. I wanted to learn about pyramids so I could give you all great insightful facts about pyramids. Uh, instead, I started learning the math of pyramids uh, because I didn't want to create my slides. So I started studying all the math behind creating pyramids. But I realized that every pyramid has a base. Um, it's the most crucial part of a pyramid. If you don't have a base, you can't have a pyramid. Um, and I thought, well, what's at the base of all our testing pyramids? It is testability. So I drew this. Uh, and I thought I'd share this with the world and see what people say. And no one says anything, they just retweet stuff. And if you ever use Twitter, that means yes. Uh, is this a good thing? Yes, people liked it. Um, but yeah, no one ever engages conversation on Twitter. It's not a good platform if you want to engage and have uh, in-depth conversations. But what I'm trying to get at here is your whole, your whole strategy to automation is pretty much based on testability. Now, if you're not familiar with the word, as I said, it's our ability to test, but it includes everything. And I'm not talking about our ability to automate. They're very different things. Um, automation exists to support our testing efforts. So we're always focusing on testing. Uh, we might heavily use automation, but there's always going to be a human part of testing. And this is where the whole testability wraps in. So my point of the pyramid now, if any of you like to use the pyramid, is what's at the base of your pyramid? And what can you do and how can you measure it to be able to define a good strategy? And that's pretty much what we're going to do next. <clears throat> so I drew another pyramid. Bit of a theme here. Um, these are the, some of the words I like to utilize to think about how to go around doing a good strategy. So we're going to run through these six, uh, and we're going to see how they impact our strategy. Uh, and if this can give us a view on testability, in turn, it can help us uh, decide why we automate and things like so, things like that. Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so the first one is team. Now. Focusing on the um, testability as we're doing, the idea of the team is who is on your team? What skills do they have? So who is around you? Who are they? Um, what languages do they know? What tools do they know? Do you have access to the developers? Are they interested in automating with you? Do they want to help out? So if you can understand who's on your team and can they contribute, uh, you're going to be in a much better position to go forward with a strategy. However, what tends to happen in companies is um, someone decides what we're hiring for. So obviously, Selenium's the coolest thing ever, right, as, as far as uh, getting a job is concerned. So we say we want someone with Selenium. Loads of people apply. They get the job. And then you start working on Selenium. But you don't really know what other skills they have, what other tools have they used, what other languages have they learned. You hired them for one little bit, and you focus on that. But if we ask them and find out they know lots of other tools, lots of other languages, it gives us more options. So I talk about people as having this invisible tool belt. Uh, I want to fill it with as many tools as I can because uh, I can then solve the problems. So do you know the skills in your team? And if you don't, go and find them. Just because you're using a certain tool set now doesn't mean you should always use that tool. So we need to understand our team. Uh, and we also need to understand our access to people, develop DevOps engineers, developers, and so forth, because that's going to help us work out who can do what and who's going to be able to automate where. <clears throat> All right, stakeholders. Ooh, stakeholders. Beautiful people. Um, but often perhaps don't have as much education in the world of testing as you lot do. Um, but you need to know who your stakeholders are. I can't see you again. Normally, I would ask you now, and I'm, I'll try it differently and see if I get a reaction. How many of you have been told just to automate? Just do it. Just automate, Richard. Automate what? I don't care. Just go do some. I was like, why? Because everyone else is doing it. Do some. Oh, OK, fine, right, I'll do some. Um, but that is an example of a stakeholder. That is, that stakeholder thinks you, you should automate. They don't know why. They probably read a tweet or a blog by someone called Richard and said you should all use automation. Um, or they've been you know, um, taken out for dinner by some marketing person and convinced that it's the next best thing. But you need to understand what you're, why your stakeholder wants you to do what you're doing. Um, so for example, I'm, I'm being a bit uh, mocking there, for example, but if you're being automation's being pushed on you by um, people upstairs, you should ask them why. Uh, I've been coaching a lot of teams, and a lot of them just, whatever comes from upstairs, they just take. Uh, the test manager said we have to automate, so we're doing it. I don't do that. <laughs> um, 
you can find I'm a bit more direct. So I would go back and find out, well, why? Why do you think automation is the answer? What problem are you trying to solve? Because if I know what my stakeholders are trying to solve, I can act accordingly. Is it that they want to release faster? Is it that they want to move to continuous deployments? Uh, is it that they think testing's taken too long or they want to retire all the manual testers or something crazy along those lines? I need to know what it is they're after because then I can use the appropriate tool. But also the customers, what do they want to do? Uh, I think there's been a few themes this morning in some of the talks um, that you know, our users do things differently than what the automation does. So if we think that we, um, uh, we, need to know, we need to be automating realistic scenarios that our users might be using in various parts of the system. So you need to know who your stakeholders are, and if you don't, it's going to be really hard for you to be able to justify your work. So why have you automated all this? Uh, I felt like it. It's the right thing to do. Um, and that's literally the answer I get a lot. Why did you automate this check? Nah, I could. All oh, right. What value does it add? Nah, I don't know. Does it, does it, has it brought you any useful information? No, no, it's never failed. Oh, okay, so it's a good automated check. It's like, yeah, it's never failed. It's awesome. Okay, right. Um, so we have to find out who these stakeholders are so we can justify our work. All right, project. <clears throat> project plays a massive part. The number of messages I've had on LinkedIn that go along this line, I'm starting a new project tomorrow. What framework should I use? A with B and C, or B with C and D, or E with F and G? I haven't quite decided which one I'm going to use yet but you've not started the project yet. No, no, I've not started the project yet. I'm going to decide, I'm deciding now what tools I'm going to use. That's not really how it works. Uh, you need to get into the project, find out how it's going to be before you can pick your tools. So one of the things on a project, again, I can't see, but I used to work at a lot of digital marketing agencies, and some of our projects would last two weeks, maybe three weeks. You're not going to write a full-blown automation framework for a two-week project. That's just crazy. But you might be able to do some little tools to help you test. Um, or you might be on a six-month project and you've got lots of time to you know, learn new tools, learn new approaches. So you need to understand the domain you're in before, uh, sorry, the project in your context, when you expect it to deliver, how often are you delivering, before you can pick your tool in. So project's really crucial. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then the product. So what kind of product is it you're working with? How much do you know about it? If you're being asked to automate your product, you're going to have to have a lot of knowledge about it. You can't just sit down and automate. One of the biggest trends and myths I'm seeing in our industry is we're really putting a huge focus on tools and being technical uh, and learning how to code. Yet, when you're asked to automate and decide what to automate, people can't answer those questions, which is a fundamental testing skill. So how much knowledge do you have in your product to be able to decide what we should and shouldn't automate? That's obviously really crucial. But also, what kind of product are you in? Are you on web, are you API, are you, you know, are you desktop, are you IoT? What is your product? What's it made up of? Uh, and also finding out who's using your product. So the more we know about the product, the easier it is to be able to automate and make decisions around it. Uh, and then <clears throat> um, the technology, obviously, that's crucial. So again, I'm going to have a sweeping generalization because I'm a fan of them. Uh, it's a web browser. It's a web app. Therefore, we automate it with Selenium. That's the go-to answer for everything. Um, but obviously, there's now lots of other tools. But more importantly, frameworks are changing. Uh, React's become really popular. And you don't really, you can do so much testing underneath the UI with React uh, that you know, there's lots of better tools out there like Jest and Enzyme and so forth. Um, but a lot of testers and a lot of automators still just see a website. So therefore, they're just looking at it as a big black box. We need to go and look inside what's going on in there what technologies are used, what frameworks are being used, because that's going to drive our tools. I was chatting to a guy at lunch um, who's testing an Angular app, and he's having nightmares with it. And again, well, the Angular's, well, Angular's just awful, but Angular's design, it's designed that way. So it is, it is harder to automate because of the way it's been built. But if you, you accept that as part of your strategy, you know it's Angular, so you act accordingly. But anyway, we need to get better at looking down the whole stack, because now the tools are so good. We can test it so many different layers, uh, but you need to understand the technologies being used. And then finally, you know, we're all hip and trendy, right? We're releasing 2,000 times a day. Um, you know, I, I've, been, I've heard of people claiming that they commit, you know, they release every 10 minutes. I, I do one commit, boom, go straight to live. Fantastic if you can do that. Um, but you need to be realistic and look at your infrastructure. 
do you have access to as many environments as you like, or do you have the testing environment? Uh, and that's the only one, and it took three months to build. If you want another one, you've got to ask now, and you'll get it at Christmas. Um, but how many environments do you have? Is there a pipeline in place? Do you have access to the pipeline? Can you add stuff to the pipeline? Um, you need to be able to do all that. More importantly, though, if it isn't in place, you need to be including that in your work. So if you come along and say, I'm going to automate all these checks using tools A, B, C, and D, if you forget to mention that you need to add it to the pipeline, you're either going to find yourself working really hard and pushing yourself to the limits and doing overtime to get it in, um, or you're going to fall short, and then they're going to moan at you and say, why have you failed? And you go, oh, well, I didn't mention the pipeline. I was like, you never said nothing about a pipeline. So the more we're aware, the more we can give better estimates and better expectations to the stakeholders I mentioned. OK. <clears throat> That bit was really dry, <laughs> but it's out the way. But strategy is a dry word. Strategy isn't, um, it's not really something we talk about a lot, but every single one of you have a strategy. You, you all have a strategy. Uh, it could just be to do the easiest thing possible. I've met so many SEDETs who have that strategy. Uh, it could be to reuse the framework that I've been carrying around like a little baby for the last year, few years, and I take it from company to company. Um, I don't know if any of you have this um, set up mentality, but there's a bit of a, a wave of people who they've built a framework. It's probably owned by the company, but they steal it when they leave anyway. Um, and then they take it to their next company, and they claim, oh, I'm going to have to do it from scratch. I'm going to have to start the whole thing from scratch, and it's going to take me at least three months. And then they copy and paste, <laughs> and then they sit there for a while. Uh, and then once it's up and running and it's time to do some automated checks, they're like, oh, no, I'm a bit bored now. Uh, I've lost that. The fun bit was building the framework that you didn't build. You brought it with you. <laughs> uh, and then they move on to the next job. Um, but that might be their strategy. That could be how they want to go about it. They bring existing stuff with them. So if we're not quite ready to build, what do we need to do? Well, we need to look at automated checks, uh, automated tests. I'm not going to get into that discussion, but um, we're going to do some automation. We need to decide where we're going to automate things. So recap. We've gone through the people. We know what tools are on our team, what skills are on our team. We know how long we've got. Uh, we know that there's a pipeline in place. We know there's infrastructure in place. We've spoken to our stakeholders. We've set expectations. We know what they want from us. Uh, and now we're ready to actually do some automation. Um, but we need to decide what to automate. So anyone who follows me, I'm a big fan of visualizing stuff. Now. We still have a pandemic in our industry where everything's done on the UI. Everything is still done on the UI. And I know why. A lot of testers were pushed into automation and they were testing on the UI. It was comfortable for them. It's a nice place to be. That's where we run all our test cases. I'm going to do my automation there as well. Some testers haven't been pushed or encouraged to go below the stack, so they've never looked. Um, some projects just don't give you the time, or some people just don't. They just, it's just a horrible environment to be in, and they won't let you go and look around. However, we, now, we have to do it now, because we're being asked to release quicker. We want to be confident. We want rapid feedback. You don't get rapid feedback if you have 5,000 UI scripts. What you get is a pain in the ass, uh, where you're constantly maintaining them. Um, and what you do end up with, like, again, I can't see you, but I'll see if anyone reacts. For six months, this was my life, uh, and it was a terrible time of my life. Uh, I would go into work, and the build would be red, and I would sit down. I'd sigh, and then I'd fix the checks that were failing. I'd commit it. It would go green. I'd smile briefly. And then I'd go to lunch. I'd come back, and it would be red again. And then I would fix it, and then I would go home. That was my life for six months. Um, and the reason is we were automating on the wrong layer. Our strategy was a complete mess. Um, so I improved my skills. So what I'm going to run you through now, this is um, a playground that myself and Mark Winteringham have built um, called Restful Booker. And it's got a login screen. And what we teach people to do is to break down what happens so you can determine what to check. So a user loads the screen. By loading the screen, they hit the website, and they get their assets back. We're using React. So I know React then builds some components, and it shows it to the user. So I now know that React's done something. Maybe I could test that. Maybe I can't. The user's going to fill in their details. That's going to send an API request. The API is going to take it and go, oh, you sent me some JSON. Is it nice? Yes, it is. OK, I'll send it to the app code. Now, this is a test app, so usually you would go to the DB at this stage. But we decided not to have a DB. So we hard coded it, very secure. Um, and then it accepts your credentials. It issues a token, sends it back to the API. 
Um, React goes, oh, you gave me a token, fantastic. I'll let you into the system. And then it redirects you to the room page, and then the user sees the room page. So now we've visualized that flow, we can identify what's going on at each seam. I call them seams, so each seam in our system. And we can now work out where should we automate? What was it we cared about? So what tends to happen is we go to the UI. But now if I'm on the UI, what is it I'm trying to do? Am I trying to test that the system accepts valid credentials? You don't want to be doing that on the UI. That's not a good place to do that, because you can see I'm going four layers down until I do that. Am I trying to see that we're talking to the right API? Eh, maybe we could do that on the UI, probably do that with JavaScript. Am I trying to test that the page looks correct, as in the right fields are on the screen? Probably going to want to do that in React, or if I want to do it visually, I might use a visual testing tool. Um, do I care about that there's no error messages shown? I could carry on and carry on with all these test ideas, but what was it we cared about? Every time we run this, someone goes, just need to test login. Why are you asking me so many questions, Richard? Just test login. Just write a script to log in and done. I was like, all right, fair enough. But if I break this down, I can end up with lots of small targeted checks. So what I'm asking you all to do is think about what it is you're trying to test, because that's going to determine the layer. But then in going back to strategy, uh, I can't really point that far, but let's say we identify we should correct, check the credentials at the app layer. Do you have the skills? So if you go back to your people, and your team, do you have the skills to do automation at that layer? If you don't, you can accept the risk and go a level higher. You have mentioned we've identified this couple of API calls. Do we have the skills to do API automation? No, we don't. Do we have a project that's going to allow us the time to learn? Maybe. And therefore, we can then justify it to our stakeholders and say, look, I need a week to learn, I don't know, rest assured, or something like that, uh, because then I can do some API automation. But you identify it by breaking down what needs to happen. If you do them all at the UI, and you can see there's a few points at the UI, any one of those dots could cause your UI to fail. But don't worry, it's all right. If it fails on the UI, we'll, we'll just blame Selenium, right? It's always Selenium's fault. It's flaky, flaky automation. Um, but it's not. It's because you're automating at the wrong layer because your strategy isn't correct. So if we break down our scripts and identify where they should be, it gives us more options. Now, this is a really simple flow, by the way. This is like the simplest website ever. Um, <clears throat> it gets a bit more complicated if you've got a bigger system. So obviously, down the left, I've kept this quite simple. I didn't really explain that. But you know, the UI being what's in the browser, JavaScript API, the actual app code, and the database. But you could have third parties. You could have anything going on. Um, but if you do more complex flows, this is creating a booking. We're going up and down the stack four times. So many things could fail in that flow, which would cause my UI script to fall over. Therefore, I don't want to do that. I want to automate at various layers um, throughout my system. But again, I need to have the skills. I need to have the time. I need to have a pipeline that can run them all. Uh, but here's a fun thing. If you turn it upside down, pyramids. Yeah, more pyramids, right? Um, <clears throat> But it kind of shows us that you know, the pyramid is a rule. It's kind of interesting that you know, we can identify different layers. Um, but the point is working out what's going on in our system, and truly understanding which bit goes wrong, and which bit impacts what, which bit does which bit. Because you can now test on all these layers. There is so many tools. There's new tools coming out every week. They're getting better. They're becoming more stable. Uh, and it puts a lot of pressure on you all. It puts a lot of pressure on me. We have to now learn two or three different languages to be a, a pretty good, effective setter. We probably need to learn a JavaScript tool. We need to learn a, a, a UI tool, an API tool. Probably need to learn a visual testing tool now. And then to do all this strategy on top, yeah, it's a big ask. But that's what needs to happen to get good automation. Um, so there's a lot going on. Uh, get past that. <clears throat> but if you do it all, this is what we aim for. Um, so my colleague, Mark Winteringham, um, came up with this mnemonic. But we basically want trim. Trims, put stuck an S on the end, we'll, do, we'll ignore the S for a minute. Uh, we want trim automated checks. If you have a load of checks that look like this, they're too big. You need to trim them down. You need to make them smaller. And we do that um, by using this mnemonic. So we want them to be targeted. And when we say targeted, we mean on risk and we mean on layer. So the, you need to find the lowest point you can mitigate that risk and automate at that layer. You need them to be reliable, of course. You don't want to be the guy I was, coming into work, fixing broken automated checks all day. Why, one thing, it's really, really boring. Like, it is incredibly boring. Um, but also, 
I didn't know very much about our system. We actually had a bit of a really bad situation about four months after me doing that for four months. No one knew how this system worked because no one was testing it as a holistic view anymore. I was fixing little small targeted checks constantly that I never saw the bigger picture. And we actually, our quality plummeted um, and we had to change our approach. So we need them to be reliable. You need to know when you look at that green radiator that it means what you think it means. And we do that by making them informative. If they pass, you should know exactly what's passed. If you have a login flow on the top of the UI, you know that they've logged in, but you don't know the system works. The API could have just been returning 200 constantly. You have no idea. Um, so we have to have lots of small targeted checks so we know what's going on. And of course, we need them to be maintainable, which is a whole new world in itself. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to go on to make checks maintainable. Uh, obviously, writing good, clean code is one of them. But the, the easier you are to maintain, the quicker it will be to you to get them up and running. And you will, you will have to maintain such automated checks. They will fail. That's the whole point of them. If they don't fail, it makes me really itchy. <laughs> if I don't see checks fail on each commit or every other commit, I get a bit nervous. Um, because that's the whole point. They're there to detect change. And if we've just committed loads of changes to files and none of the checks have failed, I'm a bit unsure why. And finally, fast, right? We need to be faster. How many of you have been told to go faster? Faster, Richard. Faster, Richard. I can't move any faster. Type quicker. I can't type any quicker. Um, but we need to be faster. Um, people are demanding that we test quickly. Um, but it's not so simple. It's not that straightforward. But we do know, uh, as much as I mock the pyramid, checks that tend to be higher up tend to be a bit slower. Uh, they are getting faster. Don't get me wrong. Browsers have become quicker. Web drivers quicker. You can go headless if you want, which is, don't do that. Uh, but that's another talk. Um, but you can go headless if you want. None of your users use a headless browser. Just so you know this, um, I've never booked a hotel using a headless browser. Um, <clears throat> Um, but we need to find ways of being quicker, and smaller targeted checks make it quicker. So then we come back to the pyramid. I decided I couldn't draw pyramids with straight lines. <laughs> I tried. Um, but going back to the pyramid, if you've done everything I've just described, you've gone over your, um, your strategy, you've gone over your testability, you've identified the right seams, you've automated them all, and you end up with something that doesn't like a, look like a pyramid, well done. Fantastic. Perfect. That is what should happen. Because the pyramid was designed as a heuristic. Do, the pyramid is designed to say someone believes that's the ideal shape for automated checks. But you should use it as an heuristic. Look at it and go, I don't look like the pyramid, but that's OK. We don't have any, um, if I take the, the, um, take the one on the left. So we don't need to have a lot of stuff on our UI. Um, our, unit t our developers don't like writing unit tests. I don't have the skills to write unit tests. So therefore, we've gone really heavy on our API. You've justified it. You've been able to explain why. And that's the important bit. We suck at it. I don't know how many of you agree, but testers are really bad at talking about testing. We're really bad at talking about automation as well. So if we can justify our work and our reasonings, uh, we can look at our models and go, actually, no, we're doing good. But actually, I would, I would like a bit more unit tests. So let's do some initiatives to get more unit tests. And then finally, <clears throat> I'm going to leave with a fart model. Um, this is one of the very earliest models I drew. Um, but it stands for the flawed approach to regression testing. And I thought that was a bit boring. Uh, and then I realized it spelled fart. And I thought that's a lot more interesting. Um, so I called it the fart model. But the idea here is, and what I'm trying to get at finally, is you can do lots of fantastic automation work. And I've seen teams do it brilliantly. And it is possible. It takes a lot of hard work to learn all those tools, do all this strategy, thinking about testing still, thinking about quality. Um, but you can do it. Uh, and teams can do it. And I must add as well, it is a team activity. To do automation really well, everyone needs to buy in. Um, but it isn't the holy grail. You can't just automate. You have to keep going at it with, I hate the word manual, but the manual efforts, exploratory testing, discovering new information. And the reason why is because of the FAR model. Um, so what I'm trying to put across is the system's always changing. The fact the system's changing means you've got a job, right? If the system ain't changing, why are you even there, right? So the system's always changing. And our knowledge of the system is always limited. You can never fully understand the system. It's impossible. So therefore, we only ever have so much knowledge. And you can't create an automated check if you have no knowledge. How are you going to know if it's good, if it's right, if you've got a good assertion or a good oracle? So therefore, we can only ever automate so much of our knowledge. If you try and chase 100%, you're always going to fail. Because there's always going to be gaps appearing in your knowledge, and you're going to have to go and fill them. 
And by filling them, you have to go do some testing. You have to go ask people some questions, discover some information. So we will never succeed with doing 100% regression testing, so please don't try. Um, we can succeed by getting a computer to do 99% of it, and we do the last 1%. Um, but there's always going to be a human element of it. Um, so this model tried to dictate that, um, pictate that, sorry, not dictate. Um, <clears throat> and I use this to explain to people that we can't have fully automated testing. It simply doesn't exist. Uh, and I, another way of proving this, and again, I can't see your hands, so we'll just uh, see how it goes. Um, your automated checks probably find, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 bugs a release or something along those lines. But while you're creating those automated checks, I can guarantee you probably find more bugs. You will find more bugs creating the automation than the automation will find itself. Um, because you're discovering, you're exploring, you're looking under the hood. Uh, and that's why we always have to have that human factor. OK, <clears throat> I forgot my summary slide, so never mind. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's all right. <laughs> so think about your strategy. Uh, you might not have one. You might, you, sorry, you will have one, but you might never have verbalized it. I strongly encourage you to verbalize your strategy. Um, get drawing some pictures, explain to people, look at all the different com um, components of understanding testability, because that's what drives your automation efforts. And then be selective and targeted about where you automate. Pick the right scene, pick the right layer. But again, it's based on the skills you have. If you don't have the skills to automate an API, do you have the time to learn? Can the, someone be brought into the team, which then changes the team testability, and then they can help you? But there is always a strategy. And if we pick the strategy, we can really succeed with automation. It is possible um, to have really good, reliable, valuable automation. Uh, apart from that, uh, if you want to know more about me, um, there's automationintesting.com, which is a, a, a blog me and Mark Winteringham run. Automationintesting.online is a playground to learn automation, and then there's some blogs. And then you can find me, as mentioned earlier, on Twitter. I kind of tweet far too much. Uh, but you can find me on there. But apart from that, if anyone wants to chat to me while I'm here, I'm still going to be around. I think we've got some time for questions now. And I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, SourceCon. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
All right, well, I'll be outside. <clears throat> Go for it. Yeah.